to uh, this book, uh, The Advanced Bible Course by E.W. Kenyon, and um, as a teacher for these chapters, these can take you so far and in so many different directions, um, where, what and where do you teach from this book? You know, it's amazing. Um, the majority of what I'm going to teach today is found from lesson number six. And then the rest of it um, has come just from uh, what the Lord's been saying to me uh, in my life and uh, just revelation that the Lord's given me for myself and for us. Because everything that the Lord gives to us is not just for us, it's for us to share, you know. And revelation should increase throughout the generations because we should be passing this on to the, uh, from one to the next. And... Um, what the Lord is doing in me, you know, is having me uh, read simple truths that I've read a hundred thousand times before and becoming life to me. Um, I believe also in the early stages of my ministry, too, he's uh, causing me to, to teach very simple truths and his anointing comes on it. And it comes alive to you, and that way you get the truth, and I don't uh, have any temptation of pride, because I don't tell you deep things. I tell you very simple things, and the anointing brings it to you, brings it alive to you. That way it keeps, helps keep me humble, <laughs> and it also brings these things alive to you. Um, one of those revelations... Um, that's been going on, and when I read chapter 6, I was like, this is, this is amazing. Um, what the Lord's doing through books and different teachers is he, he's using them to give me words to what he's been saying to me in my private, personal time with him. And then I'll see these teachers and read some books, and I'll say, wow, Lord, thank you. You're, you've just given me the tool to be able to explain this to others. And one thing... It's so simple, yet we need to know is, in Lesson 6, you can just turn there if you have your books. Um, I'm not going to read right out from the book, but the reality of our redemption. He talks about that, and he says that, you know, as long as the word redemption, you know, is just a theological term, it's just religion to us. And it's just like, okay, great, I've been redeemed. Wonderful, you know. But when we really realize what that means, with, with the true revelation, what God is doing is He wants to give us a brand new nature. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, you know, He who is in Christ has become a new creation. You know, old things have, are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And in the Amplified, it says that we have become a new species of being. And my tendency um, before would be to want to plow through a bunch of material and stuff because I'm so excited about it, and I want you all to get it. But what's, what's happening now is I want to slow down and give you a little bit less and let you chew on it. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 18 says, now all things are of God. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So that is our calling. That is each and every one of our callings. If you're wondering what your calling is, you are a minister of reconciliation. It is as though God is, was in Christ reconciling the world through us, and he's using us as his ambassadors. Isn't that, isn't that awesome that he would use us 
as his ambassadors. And it says in verse 20, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He's given us a new nature. That's part of the redemption. It wasn't just a forgiveness of our sins. He didn't just blot them out. He didn't just rent the veil. So we could come into the presence. He did that so we could have a completely new nature. And um, as, as human beings, we can have good fathers, good mothers, good friends, good people that we know and um, who accept us for who we are and who when we make mistakes and have faults and do stupid things, they look past them and they still love us and they don't condemn us. And what the Lord is showing me is, you know, in many ways we've become so religious and we don't even know it. And um, so now our new identity must be in him. You know, and although we struggle to do the will of God, we all struggle, right, to do the will of God. We need to know, even though we're struggling to do the will of God, we are loved by God. We, we are lovers of God. That's who we are now. We're lovers of God who struggle with sin. We're not sinners struggling to believe that God loves us. Does that make sense? Or should I say it again? It says we're not, we, we're lovers of God who sometimes and occasionally we struggle with sin. We're not sinners anymore struggling to believe the love of God. And I want to bring just some super simple common sense that we somehow apply to every other person in the whole world except for God. You know, somehow we think that he's, you know, when we think of the word worship, we think, well, after all, he is God. He is the creator. We owe him this worship, you know. We, he's all powerful. He's all, so we say, oh, Lord, we thank you. We bow down before you. You are so great and you are so wonderful, and He is. But in order to please God, we need to know what does He want from us, right? How can, you can't please someone if you don't know what they want. So we have to ask ourselves, what does God want from us? My dad, um, and maybe I'm sure every one of you has someone like this in your life when you go Christmas shopping or shopping for a birthday or whatever, and there's just a person that's just so hard to buy for. You know what I'm talking about? And my dad was, was that, that guy. Like, he didn't need anything. He didn't really want anything. Um, and so it was kind of like a little bit of competition between my sister and I and that we would try to find him a gift that he would like. And it wasn't about, it wasn't, the competition was, was, was actually good in nature. It wasn't about between me and her. It was, we wanted to please him. We wanted to get him something. And one year I got him a watch. He, he, um, his watch was really bad, and I got him a watch. And, and he wore it for like, he loved it. He took his watch off right uh, on the spot, and he put the new one on right away. And he didn't know anything about the watch, how it worked. And it was really cool because every year when the daylight savings time came, he would come to me. And we worked in the same shop for a while there. And he'd come to me, and he, he always called me Bob. He'd say, Bob, I need you to change the time. Because he, he didn't even know how to do that. And I loved to do that for him. And I, you know, I would like to train him and teach him how to do it. He really wasn't interested. But at the same time, I thought it was awesome that he would come to me and I would be able to change that time for him. And I got him that watch. And each year I'd look at the watch and I'd kind of secretly be hoping it would be 
getting bad so I could get him another one because I didn't know what to get him. You know, I finally got him something that he really loved. And, um, and I'll come back to that. You know, we as parents, as, as uh, leaders, as uh, adults, um, if we have children in our life that are just continually striving to get us to love them, it comes to the point, you know, they keep doing different things and you say, you don't have to do those things to earn my love for you. I love you. Right? You love your, you all have children? I don't have children, but, you know, I love people, you know, a pastor over some children. And they don't have to strive and continually do things to get me to love them. I simply love them. And occasionally they'll do some dumb things. And I overlook those things. And I say, I've done dumb things. I sure hope, you know, when I do, and I will continue to do some dumb things. I sure hope, you know, there's not just one thing I could do that was stupid and all of a sudden Pastor Bob doesn't like me anymore. You know? But yet, in our religious mindsets, I'm talking to charismatic, Pentecostal, tongue-talking people who we think we are just the most opposite of religious as you can be. And sometimes we're religious in striving against religion, <laughs> if you, that makes sense. We're going to fight so hard against this religious spirit, we're just going to be religious about it <laughs> and not even know it. But yet at the same time, we can see how we can look over people's faults and we can forgive them and we love them. How much more the Father forgive us our sins, overlook our faults. He's not so quick and ready to cast us out of his presence the second we do something that displeases him. You know, the word says we've had earthly fathers, right? They've disciplined us, they've chastened us, and yet, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't fun at the time, but yet we look back and we say, I'm glad they did that. You know, I've seen something on Facebook lately. It said something like, oh, what did it say? It said, uh, my parents spanked me when I did this, and they spanked me when I did that, and I, now I'm suffering from this disease called respect for others, something like that, you know? The Lord's saying, I love you. I already love you. I'm always going to love you, and I can't possibly love you any more than I already do. You don't have to strive to earn it. Yet we do that. I've done that. We all do that. Um, I could be somewhere tomorrow and get caught up in that. You know what I mean? So we need to learn what God wants from us. And it is only then will we understand what we can give Him. Let me tell you what He wants. He wants our fellowship. That's it. All sufficient Creator God didn't need anything from anyone, didn't you know, it, the word says, by him, through him, and through him, and in him, all things consist. Not just ex exist, but consist. There's a difference between exist and consist. 
And he, you know, the Bible says that he formed us from the dust of the earth. And then he what? What did he do? He breathed into us. Now, do you think, you think God breathes like we breathe? You know, you think he needs air to breathe? You know, God didn't create anything that he's dependent on to keep him alive. Right? So what he was saying was, God, that word breath means spirit, right? He breathed. He took, okay, right now you see I breathe in. Now that breath's inside of me, and now I breathe it out. Now it's outside of me. He took what was inside of him, and he put it inside of us. Not like air. And we died when we sinned, right? The soul that sins shall die. And we sinned every, every last one of us. And now we're... The reality of redemption in chapter... In lesson six in this book is that he put sin away. And he conquered sin. And he conquered death. And He's given us a new nature when we receive Him. And it says, the Bible says that Jesus was, is the firstborn, right, from the dead. So, if He is the firstborn, why would God go through all that trouble in the Word? Well, not all that trouble, but why would He go through and put the word firstborn if there wasn't going to be a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. And I heard a preacher say this. When you go to heaven and you stand before him, ask God, say, what number am I? Ask him, ask him what number you are. And uh, God's creating a family. He's creating a family. That word was, was amazing. He's refining us, you know, and as we go um, deeper into the things of God and we start to do, um, you know, hopefully we, we should all be maturing, <laughs> right, as we go. And as we mature, what we want from God and from things and from life changes, right? Our focus goes from things to people, right? Right? The Bible says that we know that we pass from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. And that's an awesome word. So it's like we can even measure. If you say, I'm starting to love God more and you're not loving people more, you're really probably not loving God more. Because as you start to love God more, you're going to start loving people more. And people, you're going to see, start to see people as the most valuable, unsaved people, as the most valuable thing on earth. God's showing me this. He's telling me this. So I'm trying to slowly tell you this. All he wants is our fellowship. Jesus did nothing for himself. He already had it all. Everything he did, he did it for us. We are the passion that was before him. I got so much going on, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. You ever get that way? You, you, the closer you get to God, the more you, you think you know absolutely nothing. You know. I've ministered to people and ca even counseled people, and, and they're, they're looking at me, you know, to help them and to, to guide them through this. And they're telling me some serious, serious stuff. And at the end, instead of giving them, you know, their pat, that pat Christian answer that, that they've heard before, I'll say, 
All I know is God is good. And don't give up. That's all I know. And when I went, I went to this marriage conference before I got married. About three, four months before I got married, there was a marriage conference here. And uh, Megan had to, she was in college at the time. She, had, she couldn't come. So I came down by myself. And they said that they were talking, this couple was talking to this man who was the, the um, world most uh, expert on marriage. And uh, <laughs> like married 75 years, and I can't even remember his name. And they said, if you could only tell, give one bit of advice to a married couple, only one thing, what would you say? Now, I'm not married. I wasn't married yet when I heard this. And he said, don't give up. And I thought, what? <laughs> don't give up? <laughs> this man doesn't know much about marriage. <laughs> 75 years as a marriage expert who can only say one thing, don't give up? What? Well, then I got married. <laughs> right? Do you ever want to give up? I mean, I have a great marriage, and, you know, I have my days. I have a, I have a little argument here and there, and my mind goes to, oh, just, I just want to get away. I just want to run away. I want to give up. That's how we can be in our relationship with the Lord. We're doing really well. We're walking with God. And all of a sudden, we do something stupid. And we think, and it, even, and it surprises us. Have I told you this before? It surprises us, even the stupid thing we did. And we go, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. And all of a sudden, we think because we're surprised, then God all of a sudden was surprised. And now he's starting to maybe renegotiate how he thinks about us, like we do with people, you know? We're in a relationship with somebody. We have a friendship with somebody. They do something, and we start negotiate, renegotiating in our mind. Do I really want to be this person's friend anymore? Do we do that? Or does it, am I the only one that does that? I mean, they're not words maybe that we say, but they're thoughts that we have. And I want to just say simply that his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts, praise God, are so much higher than our thoughts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm getting off my notes. I like it in the, in the book. It says redemption. It is ours. Page 42. In the, near the bottom it says redemption. It is ours. Just as the money you have earned in your pocketbook honestly is yours, your redemption is yours. And the Lord wants us to enjoy our rights in redemption. You know, and I know that the Lord's not this cruel taskmaster. Like, you know, when I was younger, I always thought he was just, I had this picture of him with this white hair and kind of looking like a wizard with a white beard. And he was just ornery and cranky and just waiting for me to mess up so he could crack the whip. How many parents do that with their kids? Very few. No, no good parents do. And he, so he's not like that. I'm trying to break some of the myths and some of the thoughts that we have that just creep in. We would never maybe say them out loud, but we think them. So when we became born again, we were spiritually dead, right? Sin came, and we became spiritually dead. And Nicodemus came to him and Remember Nicodemus, and he said, you must be born again. And he's like, what? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb a second time and come back again? And, 
And Jesus said to him, he goes, oh, what's flesh is flesh. You know, he's thinking, Jesus never talked to a born-again person. Do you know that? <laughs> never once. Because there was no such thing as a born-again person. Because Jesus hadn't died yet. He hadn't put the blood in front of the Father. I love how E.W. Kenyon talks about that. He says, the, the supreme court of heaven, the, just, the claims of justice were satisfied. And uh, I, love, I love listening to how he, um, how he speaks in here. And so Jesus never spoke to a born-again person. And um, he said, basically what he said was, flesh is flesh, you know. Spiritually dead people, they reproduce spiritually dead people. You know, you have kids, they're spiritually dead. And when we became born again, just as just as the Lord uh, created Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed, not breath, right? God doesn't breathe. He put his nature inside of Adam. He did the same thing once again. To us, when we became born again, he take, took his new nature, a brand new nature, and he breathed it. He put it inside of us. Now, angels, angels were made, right? We were born. It says that we were the, he was the firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. Now, if you were, you know, how many of you have ever made, like, my mom, she made a um, teddy bear for me when I was little. She had a... Uh, a sewing machine, and she would make our own teddy bears, and, you know, sometimes the nose would fall off, and she'd, you know, you'd see it without the nose. You'd be, like, six, five or six years old. You'd be like, oh, teddy bear doesn't have a nose, you know? And then she'd put, she'd put a new one on. Have, have you ever made clothes or made anything? Okay. Was that different than giving birth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I've made some things, and uh, I think it'd be different than making, creating something and giving birth to something. Okay? <laughs> the angels were made. We were born. There's a big difference. We were born again from the inside, and God put his nature on the inside of us. And we became able to uh, harness, not all harness, contain the love of God now that he has. Whereas before, we, we couldn't have the love of God in us when we had the old nature. I remember going to work before I got saved. And uh, where I work is uh, probably like any other place. You know, a lot of negativity, a lot of complaining, a lot of... Um, and I was just right in the heart of it all. I was as, you know, big a complainer, uh, you know, before I got saved, foul mouth, uh, dirty jokes. Uh, I was a young guy, you know, I was even known to having the, you know, the new stuff, the new dirt and crud, you know what I mean? They looked to me for new material. And I remember going into work before I got saved going, I'm not going to complain today. I'm not going to get involved in this stuff. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. I last maybe four minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Through my will, grit, determination, old nature. And then I got born again. Oh, I tell you what, it was different. And the Lord said, no, you're not going into there right away. You're not going in there right away and preaching to those guys. Would that have worked for you? No. <laughs> he said, there's going to come a time where you're going to preach to them, and you're going to use words to them, but it's not now. You're just going to go in there and live your life in front of them, and then the words will come. So, okay, well, how does that work? So I get born again, and I got delivered from things like instantly right away. I don't know why some people get delivered right away from a bunch of things and other people work on them for a while. 
I mean, there's all things that we work on for a while. <laughs> but the Lord just, I just quit swearing right away. Like, I didn't struggle with it anymore. Like, you're not going to catch me swearing. You know, you're not going to catch me. I don't. I don't. I, and I stopped. And so all I did was I came into work. I was a little quieter because I didn't have a whole lot to say because they surely didn't want to hear what I had to say. And I just quit swearing. And about a week, they're going, what happened to you? So now the words come out, right? I didn't do anything for the words to come out. The one guy says, we're going to see Pearl Jam. This is a band that I just really love. And I would have just jumped at a chance to get a ticket for that in a heartbeat. And I had gone to the concert with them, a couple of guys, a few times. And they said, we're going, we're getting Pearl Jam tickets, you know. You want them? And I was like, no. I said, I don't, I don't listen to them anymore. They're like, wait a second. <laughs> what is going on with you? I, had, like, I haven't heard you say anything negative. I hadn't heard you swear. I, you know, and now you're not going to see Pearl Jam? I said, you want to know what happened to me? Yeah, I want to know what happened to you. I said, you sure? He said, yeah. God spoke to me. <laughs> he told me I was either going to change my life or I was going to die. He told me that he was the only way, Jesus Christ. And I need to follow him and give him my whole life. And I knew like five scriptures. <laughs> I said, and he put a new nature inside of me. And I'm different now. I said, I'm, no, I'm not saying I'm never going to do anything wrong. But I'm going to try my best not to get involved in this stuff. And now I had power to do it. And the power came from the new nature. Not my grit in my teeth. I had a new nature. And I'm getting that stuff out of this, chapter 6, and some other preachers I've been listening to. And I want you to know, and, uh, you know, I preach this to myself, you know, every other day, and we need to. God's not mad at us. He's not mad at us. And just like parents, we're not always pleased with everything our kids do. And he's not pleased <laughs> with all the things that we do. But he's not mad at us. He surely understands us, just like you would understand your kids. And he went to the cross anyways for us. So just as that word came, that prophetic word came, you know, God is refining us. He's doing a work inside of our hearts. And he's taking away the stuff that we don't need. You know, he's burning up the dross in us, you know, like the gold being purified. You know, the, the, the lesser things, the lesser metals, the, you know, they just come up to the top and then they scrape them off. And I believe that. That was, like I said, I hadn't heard that before. Um, the Lord is refining us because he wants to do a work through the church that the earth has never seen before. And I'm, I'm excited about it. And... Um, I have, what, 10, 9.45? Yeah, okay. All right, I got six minutes. What can I say in six minutes? Let me take a 30 seconds and pause. Well, I am, my name is Robert, and you know me a little bit. New nature, new tongues. Prayer language. Pray in your prayer language. It only stands to reason if your spirit is praying, your spirit is what's going to receive. Revelation. Understanding. Understanding. 
What does God want? Our fellowship. First begotten. New nature. Angels were made. We were born. We have the very life and nature of God inside of us. You know, in Second Peter, first one of the Peters, it says that he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have it. You know, before the cross, you know, in, in, in Romans it says, you know, Abraham believed God, right? And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Remember that scripture in Romans 4? So he had a righteousness that was accounted to him through faith. Yet, the cross never hadn't come yet. So we see through scripture, through the, you know, I can't go into it all, but the, uh, they, they were in Lazar, or Abraham's bosom, right? Remember the man, Lazarus, he died, and the rich man died, and the rich man was in hell, and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. And so those who, who were righteous with God through faith, that accounted righteousness, they were in Abraham's bosom. They weren't yet in heaven yet. And that, that righteousness was accounted to them, and that... that um, account was charged to the cross, right? Like an account, it was, a char- it was charged to the cross. And when the cross came and Jesus put the blood up in front of the Father, they went from that, that, that accounted righteousness was given to them through Jesus' righteousness, and they went into heaven. Now, if the cross failed, they would have dropped from Abraham's bosom, Right, in, right into hell. But the cross didn't fail. And I say that because I want to paint, I really want to paint a picture that where our righteousness really stands. We've heard that. Our righteousness stands in the cross. And all those before us that that righteousness through faith was accounted for righteousness was delivered up into heaven because of the cross. Am I making sense? I mean, I, I have so much going on in my mind and what I want to say. You have a question? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think Abraham's bosom was a pretty nice place. I think it was a paradise um, compared to our walk on earth, you know. And I do know from the scriptures that, you know, it is his righteousness that gets us into, you know, heaven. And that blood wasn't presented yet to the Father because he had to go down into hell. And take the take the keys and you know, kick Satan in the face, you know, and get him in the Muay Thai clinch and knee him in the head and do all that MMA stuff to him and take the keys and so I would say that's paradise. I you know, that's that's what I'm giving to you. Maybe we can talk about it more. Yeah. I think you said the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Scripturally, that's what makes the most sense to me. You know, if you asked the man, the rich man that was in hell, he asked, he said, he didn't even say, Abraham, could you, could you put a little water on my tongue? He asked this beggar guy that he despised, that sat at his own gate, could Lazarus, this man that I had no respect for, in the whole world, could he put a little water around my tongue? I think he was in paradise. All right, I got one minute. So now, as we becoming mature, 
And now as we're seeking the Lord at the highest level that we have ever sought him before, right? Let's be careful that we don't seek the wrong thing and seek power, you know, look to see what he can give us. But let's seek to be holy before him and to be right with him. And we know that he loves us. And we know that as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything that we need will be added unto us. So we don't have to seek for miracles. We don't have to seek for, you know, the giftings that we have. As we fellowship with him and as we, you know, are holy before him, he will develop everything that we need. So seek him, seek his face. He's not mad at you. Just like a good friend or a good person would never hold your faults against you and cast you away. How much more does he understand who we are, how weak we are, and love us more than anybody there is? So let's just rest in that. And that's what I'm learning to do is to enjoy him. Because what dad doesn't want the kids to enjoy their life being in their presence. So, hope maybe I, I revealed a, a religious uh, attitude that we had that we might have not known. And uh, it was revealed to me as well. Because our heart, we want to please Him. We want to please God. But we're not going to please Him by, you know, just by reading so we can learn principles so we can be a better kid, you know, I mean, if there was a book called, you know, Tammy wrote a book, and her kids were just sitting there reading it and reading it, going, I want to learn how I can please my mom better, you know, I want to read the, I want to learn principles so I can love my mom better, and she's like, listen, just, just spend some time with me, just talk to me, just ask me, what do you want, you know, you don't need to read the book. I'm not, you know I'm not talking about not reading the Bible. Yeah, I'm not saying that. You know I am not saying that, okay? I'm saying we don't please him because of the principles of a matter of educational learning. We, we read the word, we find out what pleases him, and we do that because we love him. So, okay, I went over a couple minutes. Love you guys. I'll be around. Bye.